And let me just pray uh, before we begin and pray as we look at God's word together that he would speak to us. Lord, I thank you for the Bible. Lord, I thank you for giving us your word. I thank you that this morning we can look at it together knowing that you speak to us. So Lord, I pray as we read it and as we hear it, help us, Lord, to seek to live it in our lives. Lord, I thank you for what we've heard this morning in songs of praise, Lord, in testimony of changed lives. Lord, I pray that reality for each one in this room, that we would experience the changed life that only you can give. In your precious name, amen. I want to begin this morning by reading the first two verses of our passage. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Let me read these to you. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith what would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. We have a choice this morning as we look at this passage. Are we going to live under the law under the law of God or are we going to choose to live within the family of God? And in this passage, what Paul does is he gives us a picture of what life would look like if you were to choose to live under the law. He gives us two pictures in these two verses of what life would look like for you if you were to say, yes, I am going to live my life under the law. The first picture that he gives is the picture of prison. Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. If we were to choose today to continue to live under the law, do you know what we would be living like? We would be living like people who are imprisoned. When Paul talks about the law, He talks in two aspects of the law. He talks about the whole law, and he gives us a summary of the law. And you can see an example of that in Galatians 5, 14. Just look at Galatians 5, 14. It says this, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says this, The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You should love your your neighbor as yourself. So we've got this idea, this picture in the Scripture of the whole law, and we've got the picture in the Scripture of a summary of the law. So when we talk about the whole law, what we're talking about is is kind of the first five books in the Bible. Those first five books in the Bible, they're called the Torah. And in that law, there are these instructions that God gives for His people to live by. And then you have this summary of that law, which we would call the Ten Commandments. Now, what Paul is saying is this, if you are going to live under that law, if you are going to live under that law, then what you are choosing is this, you are choosing to be imprisoned. Because if we would continue to live under the law, that's exactly what the law does. It imprisons us. Now you say, Shane, how can you say that living under the law would be like living in prison? Last week you said that the law was beautiful. That's what I said last week. I quoted many verses from Psalm 119 to tell us that the law is beautiful. In Psalm 119 verse 70, the psalmist said, I delight in your law. In Psalm 119 verse 97, oh how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. In Psalm 119, verse 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. So how on earth, if the law is so beautiful, if we choose to live under it, how could, how could it be like prison for us? What is Paul saying? 
Well, the image is kind of like this. Luana, she went and visited Spike Island. Spike Island is Cork's Alcatraz, right? Spike Island is, is, is the, the old prison island that we have out in, in Cork Harbor. And in the early 1900s, the British Army, they held this prison and they had over a thousand prisoners in there related to IRA uh, suspicion of being involved in the IRA. There's about over a thousand prisoners in that prison. And there was this story that goes of, of the jailbreak. I love stories of jailbreaks. There's a story of, of this jailbreak, and what happened was there, was there was rubbish at the certain part of the prison, of the jail, and what these guys were asked to do was clean out the rubbish from that part of the prison, and as they cleaned out the rubbish from that part of the prison, they realized there was like loose bricks and, and an area that they could break out from. So what they did is they moved the rubbish away, and they slowly were etching away to... Uh, provide for their escape out of the prison. There were seven men who got out of the prison. One of them was from Passage. I do not doubt that. <laughs> I can't remember his name now. Something O'Mahony. So seven of them, they break out. They come to the shore and there's this boat that they can't lift uh, uh, from the shore onto, like, onto the water. So what one of the prisoners realizes is he looks out and he sees a boat and he decides to swim out to the boat, but the boat is tied down. And do you know what he does with the rope? This is actually true. He gets the rope and he bites into the rope and he chews it down so he can get the boat out and get the seven prisoners off of Spike Island. They were free. Why do I tell that story? I tell that story for this one reason. Every single prisoner who has ever been in prison wants one thing. They all want to be free. Every single one who is imprisoned, they want to be free. And that is how the law is beautiful. Because what the law does is it doesn't free us, it imprisons us. And when you feel like you're in prison under the weight of your sin, what do you want? You want to be broken out. You want freedom. And the only way of freedom is through faith in Jesus Christ. There is a way out of that prison because what the law does, if you seek to follow after all the commands of God, if you tried to follow after all of the commands of God in the Old Testament, do you know what you would feel like? You would feel imprisoned. You would feel shackled. You would feel like this is impossible work to do. This is so, so tiring to constantly try and, and keep up with all of these commands. And what it does is it tires us out and says to us, I want to be free of this. And so the freedom from the law is provided in Jesus. That's one picture of the law. The law is like a prison. It imprisons us. The reformers gave us another picture of the law. And the other picture of the law is this. It's, the law is like a mirror. Now, I don't know how many of us looked into a mirror this morning, but here's what happens to us when we look into a mirror. You don't look into a mirror for too long. And especially the older you get, the, the less length you look at that mirror. The reason why you don't look at the mirror for too long is this. The longer you look at it, what do you see? More and more and more and more imperfections. And that is one of the purposes of the law. Not only to imprison us, but the law, it is like the law of God. It is like a mirror showing us all of our imperfections. That's Paul's point in Romans 3.20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in the sight of God by observing the law. You won't be declared right before God by keeping the Ten Commandments. You know, when I talk to people on the streets in Cork, and I ask people, you know, like, do you think you're a good person? Well, I try to keep the Ten Commandments. No, actually, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is this, is to show you your imperfections, not to get you perfect. Can I be made right by observing the law? No, rather it is through the law that I become aware or conscious of my sin. So the law of God, it imprisons us. The law of God, it is like a mirror for us. And you could also say that the law of God, it is like a weight for us. 
I don't know when the last time you stood on a weighing scales was. Sometimes it's not fun, is it? You stand on those scales. Do you know what would be even worse to do when you stand on those scales? When you stand on the scales, do you know what you're trying to do? Stand with as little weight as possible. Take the t-shirt off, all that kind of stuff. It would be foolishness to grab a bunch of weights and start adding to that. But that's what the law does. It gives you more and more weight. It increases your sin. And this is what Paul says in Romans 5.20. The law was added so that sin might increase. So God actually gave us a law to get us in more trouble. And you say, how on earth can that be good? Because Paul continues to say in Rome, it's so wonderful. Romans 20, Romans 5, verse 20. The law was added so that sin might be in, might increase, but he says, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So one of the reasons why the law is kind of like this weight that increases our sin is so that we begin to see the absolute beauty and wonder of God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last picture I want you to see of the law is in verse 24. Not only does the law imprison us, not only is the law like a mirror for us, not only is the law a weight uh, that increases our sin, but he says this, verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. This other picture of the law is a picture of a guardian, a custodian. Back in the ancient world at that time, what you would have is often maybe slaves or whatever that would help mind children, help educate children in the house until they got to a certain age of maturity. They were called the guardians. It's kind of like this. One theologian puts it this way, and I love, love the phrase. The law it was like a babysitter. That's what the law was. It was like a babysitter. And what would be weird is if, say, say we got a babysitter for our children one night. The babysitter comes over and minds the children and does a great job and then we come back after our date or whatever and the children say, do you know what, mom and dad? We want to live with the babysitter. We want to stay with the babysitter forever. See you later, mom and dad. We want the babysitter. I would feel really bad, wouldn't it? What Paul is saying to the Galatians is this. Why would you want to hold on to the babysitter when you have access to the father? The babysitter was there for us for a certain amount of time until the scripture said Christ came. The babysitter was there for us to hold us, to keep us, to wait for us that we might mature until Christ would come and we could trust in him by faith alone and then get access into the family of God. It is by faith alone, in Christ alone. So brothers and sisters, when we rely upon our own works for our own salvation, do you know what we're saying to God? God, I just want to stay with the babysitter. I don't want a father. That is foolishness. So we have a choice. Do we choose to live under this law? Do we choose to live as imprisoned people? Do we choose to live as people who look in the mirror? Do we choose to live as people who are going to be holding weights? Do we choose to live as people with a babysitter? Or do we choose to live within the family of God. It says this in verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. This is what it looks like to live in the family of God. To live under the law is to live as imprisoned people. 
To live in the family of God is to live as people with faith. Here it says, for in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. And next week I want to come back to this verse and talk about adoption and what it means to be sons of God. But what I want you to see in this verse is one simple word for now. It is the word all. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. If you want to be part of this family of God, All you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And guess what? This invitation is open to all of you this morning. It is open to every single one of you this morning. No matter what your age, no matter what your background, no matter where you come from, you can be part of the family of God by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone. Jesus said this in John, in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one has access to the Father except through me. What Jesus was saying, the only way for you to be part of the family of God is to believe in Jesus by faith alone. That is the only way you are to be part of the family of God, by faith alone in Christ alone. And then it gives us this sign of the family of God. What does it look like to be part of the family of God? It is believing in Christ by faith. And then there is this sign that we have. In verse 27 it says this, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you are part of the family of God, you believe in Christ. And if you are part of the family of God, here is what you do. You put on the sign of Christ. And what is the sign of Christ? The sign of Christ is baptism. Baptism where you tell everybody what you're doing is identifying with Christ and telling everybody, I'm part of this family. Often there are things that identify you as part of the family that you are in. Me and Luana were talking about this with someone the other day. Before she was in our family, before we got married, she was Luana Talita Nepomuceno da Camara. That was who she was. Now, Luana Dean. <laughs> Something's changed, right? There's, there's something different. There is a sign. She put aside those names and she put on one name. What was she saying? I'm in a new family. I'm in a new family. That's what baptism does. It is a sign to say and to tell all of the world that you are part of a new family, that you have an identity that is in Christ Jesus. And sometimes in our church circles, what we do is we often put down baptism. And we're right to say there's nothing holy that is about the water. There's nothing magical or salvific that's happening in baptism. But what is happening in baptism is something that is quite significant according to these verses. When you are baptized, you are baptized into Christ and you put on Christ. There's something significant that's happening in the baptism. And what is significant that is happening in the baptism is identification. I am following Jesus now. What you are saying in baptism is this. I am all in. I'm all in. Jesus is mine and he's mine forever. I am all in. And when we watched Aaron's baptism a a few weeks ago, what was he saying? He was saying to the world, I'm all in. I'm all in. A while ago when we watched Shane's baptism and Ailsie's baptism and Sarah's baptism, what were they declaring to everybody? I'm all in. It's all about Jesus now. I want to to proclaim to the world, I want to identify with him now. And what often happens to us is this. In our Christian walk, we begin to have doubts whether we are actually part of the family of God. And what Satan is really good at, what he is really good at doing, is accusing us because of our sin. 
Surely you couldn't be part of the family of God because you have done that. But what this passage, I think, would encourage us to do, brothers and sisters, is this. Not only think about our faith when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, but what if we constantly and continually thought back to the time when we got baptized? When was the last time you thought about your baptism? The place you were baptized, who was there when you were baptized, the testimony you gave when you were baptized. Because when you go back to that day, what happens is this. You can say to all those accusations, no, on that day, on that day, I declared before everyone that I am one with Christ. On that day, I declared before everyone that I am part of the family of Christ. That's what I did on that day. So I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, Think back regularly. Take time to think back to that day. And then, of course, there are some people this morning who cannot think back to that day because you have not been baptized. You have not identified yourself with Jesus. And I would encourage you, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is commanding you to identify with him, to show everybody and tell everybody, I'm part of the family of God. That's the identity we should have. And I would encourage all of you and anybody, if you have any questions on that, whether you have questions about, listen, I don't know if I want to believe or trust in Jesus. If you have questions on that, I would love to talk about that with you. And if you have questions about baptism, I would love to talk. I'm actually really good at putting people into water. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully good at bringing them out as well. But I'd love to talk to you about that. That would be an amazing thing for you to identify with the Lord Jesus in that way. That's what we do in our baptism. We are in the family by faith. Their sign of the family is that we have been baptized. And one of the ways that you know that you're in the family is this. There is a real bond and a unity within the family of Christ. What does it say in verse 28? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One of the beautiful things about being part of the family of God is that we have a great unity and a great bond in Christ Jesus. It amazes me as, you know, we hear the testimony uh, this morning and as our friends came from the States, it amazes me how you meet people for the first time and they follow and they trust in Jesus and like instantly there's a bond. That's amazing to me that I might know them. I don't even really know their personalities or anything like that, but there is a bond there, isn't there? When you believe and you trust in Jesus, there is a link that happens between God's people. And what he is saying here is that bond is really, really true, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Now, let me tell you, in, the, in this day and age, I do need to say something about this verse. What he is not saying in this verse what he is not saying in this verse is that there is absolutely no distinction at all. No distinction at all between these people. That's not what he's saying in this verse. So let me give you the example. He's not saying in this verse there is absolutely no distinction at all between men and women. He's not saying that in this verse. Because any of you who know a man and know a woman, you will say this. There is a difference between men and women. There just is. I mean, in, in my home with my children, there's a difference between men and women. In my home, within my marriage, there is a difference between men and women. There is a difference. And so Paul acknowledges that distinction within all of his writings. There is a difference. Yes, men and women are equal in dignity, value, and worth. But brothers and sisters, there is a difference. This world is telling us, no, no, no difference, you decide. No, that's, that's absolute foolishness. 
There absolutely is a difference. There is a distinction. And Paul in his writings in Ephesians 5, for example, he would say that there is a distinction between men and women in terms of their role in marriage. For example, the man is called to lead in marriage, not in a domineering way, not in a demeaning way, but how is the man called to lead? By self-sacrifice. So there is this distinction. There is this distinction in role. There is this distinction in role between men and women within their roles in the church. In, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, what we are told is, is, is the role of pastors and elders. The scripture is very clear. That role in the Bible is reserved for men. That role is there. That is not saying anything about competence. That is not saying anything about dignity, value, or worth. What that is saying is there is a difference in the role between men and women. We play differently in this world. There is, there is a difference there. And the reason I bring that out is because there is a theology right now, in Cork, right now, that is, that is pushing against that distinction within the church that is muddying the waters between different roles within the church. And I want to say clearly to our church, it is not biblical to muddy the waters between those things. There is a distinction between men and women. So what is he saying here? What he is saying here is that when it comes to the family of God, whether you are slave or free, the invitation is open to you. You can be part of the family of God. That is an outrageous thing to say in the ancient world. Whether you're a slave or free, you can get in. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, you can get in. And whether you're a man or a woman, the door is wide open to you. If you would believe by faith. Brothers and sisters, the family of God is open to absolutely every single person no matter who you are. And so what I would encourage us in a church is this. In a church like ours, we have different nationalities, don't we? Actually, our personalities are probably more diverse than our nationalities. I'll tell you that. We have a lot of different personalities, but that's besides the point. Here's the thing. Number one on our list, as the family of God, number one on our list is not our passport. That is not number one on the list. And so we need to remember as a church, my number one thing, when I come in here, it's not my nationality. My number one thing when I come into this room is that I'm in Christ and they're in Christ. And that makes a difference as to how you approach church. I would encourage you as the people of God to engage in conversations with everybody here no matter where they're from, no matter what their background is, because there is great unity in the body of Christ. And you know what will happen? When people come in here, and when people look at us, they'll say, they're completely different, but they still like each other. What on earth is going on? It's Jesus. And that speaks the gospel out to people. If you're part of the family of God, you have faith, you're baptized, you have a great bond. And you have an inheritance. Verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Brothers and sisters, if you've believed in Christ by faith, if you've identified with him in baptism, you are heirs to the promise. You will receive land, the new heaven, and the new earth. You will be part of a people, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation that will sing hallelujah to the Lord Jesus, and you will inherit the blessing of eternal life. All that inheritance is yours if you've believed in the Lord Jesus. Now Paul says to the Galatians, come here to me. What do you want? What do you want do you want to be in prison or do you want to be free? What would you like on that scale? Prison or freedom? What do you want? Would you like to look in the mirror all day and see all your perfections 
Or would you like to look at Christ for eternity and see his righteousness on your behalf? What do you want? Scale that up. Which one do you want? What do you want? Do you want to carry around the burden and the weight of your sin as you live under the law? Or do you want to cast all your sins upon him that they might be nailed to the cross? What do you want? Do you want to have a babysitter all your life? Or do you want the Father in heaven? What is it that you want? It's a no-brainer, isn't it? Trust in him by faith, and you are part of the family of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is not by the works of the law that we are saved, but it is by your work upon the cross. Lord, we thank you that we can be part of the family of God by faith. We thank you that we can identify with the family of God through our baptism. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help remind us each day that we are in the family of God and that we have an inheritance waiting for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done in our lives. And I pray that as a church, you would help us to have this great bond as a family, that we would be together, no matter what our nationality, no matter what our personality, that our primary identity would be Christian. In your name, amen.